Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug and welcome back to General Chemistry AP Chemistry videos and if you are getting tired of, of listening to me drone on about thermodynamics then you can be glad because this is the last in the series of thermodynamics videos and you've almost gotten to the end if you've watched all this. In the last video we learned about delta S and delta H and how to determine uh, you know at what types of temperatures uh, a reaction will be thermodynamically favored. We also said that there's this other quantity that helps us to see exactly how thermodynamically favored something is. It's called delta G or Gibbs free energy. This is an actual numerical measure of the thermodynamic favorability of a chemical reaction. Now the way that we calculate it uh, most commonly is with this equation right here. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now let's take a look at what each of these means. Now that delta G is the Gibbs free energy thermodynamic favorability. It's in kilojoules per mole. Now you're going to find that if the value for this is negative then it is a thermodynamically favored process. On the other hand if it's a positive value it's not a thermodynamically favored process at that temperature. So you do need to, need to know that. Now delta H is what we calculated before in all those other lessons. Change in enthalpy and the units are kilojoules per mole just like they've always been. T is the temperature and that's in kelvins. And delta S is the change in entropy in kilojoules per mole per kelvin. Now before I go too much further you might want to remember that in the previous video we noticed that uh, entropy is normally given to us in joules per mole per Kelvin. So we're actually going to have to convert to kilojoules per mole per Kelvin because we have to keep our units consistent. Otherwise we're going to have a math mistake. So make sure that you keep the units consistent on these uh, problems. So let's calculate delta G for this reaction that we dealt with in the last video. We're going to take the carbon and add that to water, uh, water vapor, and get carbon monoxide gas and hydrogen gas. And here we have the two values for delta H and delta S. So we're going to plug and chug into this equation to calculate delta G. And of course we're being asked to solve for delta G so that's going to be our unknown. Now delta H we just plug in from right here the positive 131 kilojoules per mole. Now what's the temperature here? The problem doesn't come right out and tell us. Can we figure it out? Well we do know what the temperature is. This little a degree sign right here kind of gives it away. You might remember that we mentioned this a couple times in previous videos about thermodynamics that that represents standard conditions. And one of those standard conditions is 25 degrees Celsius. Right? So that means we're at 298 Kelvins. So that's our T. And then delta S is uh, 134 joules per mole per kelvin, but we got to convert it to kilojoules, don't we? So what is that in kilojoules? Divided by 1,000, so it's 0.134 uh, kilojoules per mole per kelvin. Now we can multiply these over here to simplify this down, and then when we subtract that, we get that delta G is positive 91 kilojoules per mole. So is this going to be a thermodynamically favored process at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, it's not. If it's positive, if delta G is positive, it is not a TFP. But as we learned in the last video, they are both positive. You know, delta H and delta S are both positive. So that means that this is going to be thermodynamically favored at relatively high temperatures. Now, how high of a temperature are we going to have to get it in order to make this a TFP? Well, let's figure that out. That's what the next question is. At what temperatures would that reaction be thermodynamically favored? Now, we're going to assume, and this is kind of a, a large assumption here, but we're going to assume that delta H and delta S don't change significantly as the temperature changes. And that's, you know, for AP chemistry, for uh, uh, general chemistry, that is pretty much a, a, a true statement. Uh, let's use the same equation here. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now, we're trying to find the point at which delta G stops being positive and becomes negative. So that would be 
the line between positive and negative, which is zero, isn't it? So what we're going to have to do for this type of problem is set delta G equal to zero. So I'm going to put zero in for delta G. Now delta H is the same as it was before, positive 131 kilojoules per mole. Now this time we're solving for the temperature. It says at what temperature. So we're going to have T as our unknown this time. And delta S, don't forget to convert it to kilojoules. So it's 0.134 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Now we can solve for T. And so I can you know, move these over here. I'm going to leave out the units just for simplicity's sake. When I uh, do a sign change and divide both sides by 0.134, I get an answer that T equals 978 kelvins. That's a pretty high temperature, isn't it? Now, they're both positive. Delta H and delta S are both positive. So that means it's a TFP at high temperatures. So we're going to have to say, you're going to have to get this reaction above 978 kelvins in order to make that reaction work. Now this is a really uh, useful type of equation, a very useful type of, 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 of uh, calculation that we're doing, because if you're working in industry and you are trying to get this reaction to work, you're a chemical engineer or you're working as a chemist there in that, in that f factory trying to make these, these chemicals here, well, you need to know, you know what temperature that vat or that chamber, reaction chamber is going to have to be. And if you get it too low, you know the reaction, for all practical purposes, is not going to happen. So this is a very practical calculation for uh, using uh, thermodynamics to actually make things that are useful to us in chemistry. Now, there is another way to calculate delta G for a chemical reaction. And this is a familiar way that we've, I think we've seen this before. It's that again, isn't it? It's the sum of all the delta G's, or of all the Gibbs free energies rather, for the products, minus the sum of all the individual Gibbs free energy values for the reactants. And this is done exactly the same way as we did it for enthalpy in lesson 15, and it's done the same way as it was done for entropy in the previous video. So we're going to take this reaction and we're going to calculate delta G. Now we can look at this equation and say it's probably going to be thermodynamically favored because you know this is one of those reactions it's a precipitation uh, lead to chloride is insoluble so yeah I'm going to guess if I had to take a wild guess that this is thermodynamically favored that the delta G is going to be negative but let's just do it and see now we have to have the constants for this so you'll need a textbook or a list or a table of all these values and so the Gibbs free energy of lead ion is going to be 20 or negative 24.4 kilojoules per mole. We only have one of those, so it doesn't really change. For chloride ions, aqueous, that's negative 131.2 kilojoules per mole. We have two moles though, so we have to times it by two. We get negative 262.4. And then for lead to chloride solid, that's negative 314.1, and we have one mole of that. So once again, we're going to add up the reactants over here, and that adds up to about negative 286.8, and then we only have one re uh, product, of course, so we have that. And so it's products minus reactants, right side minus left side. So it's negative 314.1 minus 280, or minus a negative, got to be careful with the signs there, 286.8 kilojoules per mole. So we are careful with the signs there. I almost messed up. And it's negative 27.3 kilojoules per mole. And since it's negative, that means this is thermodynamically favored. And that's what we expected it to be based upon our knowledge of chemistry. And so we have a couple different ways to calculate delta G. Now, you know, thermodynamically favored processes, like I said earlier, have a delta G value that's negative. It's, it's less than zero. Now, if we think about some processes that we're familiar with, we can probably figure out if something's going to be thermodynamically favored. So how about the melting of ice on a hot summer day? Well, that 
that's going to happen, isn't it? That's a thermodynamically favored process. So it's that's a negative delta G. How about water just spontaneously decomposing into hydrogen and oxygen at 20 degrees Celsius? That doesn't happen, does it? If you take a cup of water and lay it on a table, it's not going to just, you know, decompose on you, you know. So that's not a TFP. You know, that has a positive delta G. How about this one? If you take a, uh, a cup of liquid water and you drop a 1500 degrees Celsius block of iron in there, is the liquid water going to get hotter? Oh, it definitely will, won't it? So that has, that's a thermodynamically favored process. How about this one? You have a broken egg that just spontaneously rearranges itself into a round, unbroken egg. Is that going to happen? No, that's not a TFP. So that's got a positive value for delta G. Now, with all this being said, if a process is thermodynamically favored in one direction, it is not thermodyna thermodynamically favored in the opposite direction. So if we were to flip all these processes around, like the first one, what if we say, instead of melting, liquid water freezes on a hot summer day? Is that going to just normally happen? No, that doesn't happen. So that is a non-TFP. You know, the opposite was, well, this one's not. How about we flip the second one? And hydrogen and oxygen gases react into water at 20 degrees Celsius. And yes, that does happen. If you have a spark, yeah, that's going to blow up and it's a thermodynamically favored process. So the reverse is going to happen. Now we said the third one, this one's going to happen, but what if we flip it and say that now when you drop a 1500 degree Celsius block of iron into liquid water, it gets colder? The liquid water gets colder? No, that doesn't happen. That doesn't even make sense, does it? So that's, you know, if, if it's positive, if it's TFP in one direction, it's a non-TFP in the other. And it, how about it, uh, we flip number four? An egg cracks and breaks. Well, yeah, that happens, doesn't it? So that is a TFP. So we have gone over quite a bit of what thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamically favored processes are. There's one other application of this. It's called thermodynamic uh, uh, coupling. This is where we take a process and we add these two reactions together to get a total value for delta G. It's a lot like Hess's law, except it's technically not called Hess's law. So here we have a case where we have uh, copper one sulfide and it decomposes into its, into its component elements, but this is not a thermodynamically favored process. It's got a positive value for delta G. Well, guess what? There is a, a mineral in the ground that has this copper two sulfide in it. And we might like to get the copper out of there for copper smelting or making, making things with copper like the pennies or making uh, statues or something like that or making wire. So how do you get the copper out of the copper two sulfide? Well, maybe if we add another reaction to it, what about this reaction right here? Sulfur plus oxygen gas yields sulfur dioxide. Now that reaction is really thermodynamically favored. Look at that big negative number there for delta G. Well, guess what? If you take this reactions, or these two reactions and you add them together, we can cancel out the sulfurs on both sides and we add up to get this other reaction. And guess what? Since we added those reactions, we can add up the delta Gs and we find that this one is negative. Here we have a thermodynamically favored process. And so if you have this copper one sulfide a mineral, how do you get the copper out of it? We, we've got to pump some oxygen in there. That's the answer. And so this is a, an application of thermodynamics. It's an application of Gibbs free energy here that we can use actually in industry to make things. So we can actually use the oxygen there, pump that in there, and we can get the copper out of there. Of course, we get some sulfur dioxide also that we have to somehow uh, dispose of if you can. So here we have an application. It's just like Hess's law. And if you needed to, you could always flip these around just like we did for Hess's law and get them to add up. Now, 
if you are tired of thermodynamics, I don't blame you. It is, it is, it can be a very complex topic. There's a lot that we've covered in this lesson in these last three videos. If you need to watch them again, go back and watch them, you know, work through those problems again. Let's just do a brief review so we can see what we've talked about in the last three lessons. So I'm talking about lesson 14, 15, and 16 in my AP Chemistry series uh, for all you folks who are following along. Entropy is basically disorder. That's what entropy is for all practical purposes. And chemical systems and the universe tend to get more disordered over time. Now, as long as a system increases its entropy, it can be thermodynamically favored, even if it happens to be endothermic. Uh, how do you know if something's going to be increasing in entropy? Well, it has a higher energy state. Now, maybe it goes from a solid to a liquid, or a liquid to a gas, or something like that. Or it increases in temperature, or it increases in the number of particles it has. That's more entropy. Now, we also talked about enthalpy in these uh, in this series as well. That's the total amount of heat that we're talking about. Uh, you know, normally chemical systems tend to lose heat to their surroundings, and that's why most reactions are exothermic. If you have an exothermic reaction, it's driven by enthalpy. And as long as a system is exothermic, it can be thermodynamically favored, even if its entropy happens to be going down. Here's a reaction, or not a reaction, an equation to solve for the delta G, you know, find out uh, how thermodynamically favored something is, make sure that your units are consistent, and you know, that's what delta G is. We've learned four ways to calculate delta H. This uh, takes us all the way back to lesson 14 and part of lesson 15 as well. The first way was bond enthalpies, and that was bonds broken, minus bonds formed. You got to add them all up. And this is the only one of those that's left side minus right side. All the others are the opposite. It's right side minus left side. But this is the only one that's left minus right. We can use Hess's law. And this is the one where you have to flip the equations around, solve the puzzle, kind of like the thermodynamic coupling that we saw here uh, a minute ago. It also works for delta G. Uh, delta H is the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. And of course, we can do the same thing to calculate delta S and delta G, like we saw in the last couple of videos here. And then the last way to calculate delta H is calorimetry. That's ex the experimental way. When you go into the lab and you actually, you know, measure the temperature and the masses and all that, Q equals MC delta T. Now, if we're actually trying to find the delta H, well, that's in kilojoules per mole. So we have to take the actual kilojoules transferred and divide by the moles. And don't forget, to find the actual delta H, you're going to have to do a sign change because when we determine the temperature of something, we're probably determining the temperature of the surroundings, the water, and not the actual reactions. So we have to do, do a sign change there. Uh, endothermic, delta H is positive. Exothermic, delta H is negative. Wow. Have we gotten through it all already? I think we've gotten through the entire thermodynamics section. So if you've gotten this far, then you are, you have you either have left this video on by itself without paying attention, or you are really into thermodynamics. So congratulations for making it this far. Thank you for watching. If you are a new subscriber, thank you. If you aren't a new subscriber yet, then I hope you become one by hitting that subscribe button and hitting the thumbs up if you learn something from my videos. I'm trying to put the entire AP Chemistry course curriculum online so that you can enjoy this and uh, get a five on your AP Chemistry exam or make an A in that class, an A in your college chemistry, uh, general chemistry class. I'm Jeremy Craig. I've been teaching chemistry for over 20 years, and I hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.